next up to the stage is is Michael Hasenblas from AWS. Uh, he has a very exciting talk for us uh, uh, today. Michael, are you there? Hey there, how you doing? Doing well, doing well. Uh, fo fo folks, uh, folks have been waiting to hear from you, so I'll, I'll pass I'll pass it over on to you. All right, thank you so much. Can I share my screen? If I get the right one. All right, can you see that? Looks good. Okay. Yep. How about now? Cool. All right. So that's a lot of text. All I'm saying, um, I've been around for a little bit, been doing um, containers for a little bit, actually worked uh, at the same company as Matt before, uh, trying AWS a bit more than a year ago. And um, they are mainly looking now after uh, open source observability, service meshes, GitOps. And there are various places where we can hook up and, and chat. Uh, Twitter DM is are, are open, um, or Slack, CNCF, AWS Developer Slack, WeFORKS, uh, Community Slack. So wherever you can find me, just reach out. Happy to talk. Enough about me, about you. If one of those three is true, then you should pay attention. If not, go and have a, a nap or a coffee or whatever. Uh, if you're an architect tasked with a new cloud native app, if you're a principal staff level engineer and you're evaluating tools and methods, seeing how that fits in, if you're a CXO level, CIO, CTO, CSO responsible for a digital transformation project, you should be paying attention right now. I'm gonna address a few things around GitOps that might be relevant for your work um, very soon. Let's step back a bit and have a look at a concrete example. Imagine you're um, having the case of a monolith here, um, some kind of e-commerce uh, web application, whatever. And you have various interfaces there to external systems, ERP systems, um, some you know, risk profiles, some SSO, single sign-on solutions, payment APIs, et cetera. If you've done a good job, you probably also uh, did you know modularize all your your components here, and you can pretty easily split this monolith into a microservices. In our case, a containerized microservices setup. Now that's great. Gives you a lot of uh, good points there: velocity, developer velocity. You're faster shipping uh, new features and fixing bugs in production. Uh, you're also now in a position that you can use different kinds of programming languages. Let's say the renderer part is written in Node.js and access control in Java, et cetera. Uh, different data stores, let's say the, the shopping parts get wish list might use Redis and for transaction management, you're using a relation database, right? So polyglot programming languages and data stores. And you can also achieve partial high availability, right? That's great. Your entire application might be degraded, you might only be able to put stuff into your wish list, but not check out, but still something is working. And you, um, if you have been using some kind of app or web in the last web app in the last 10 years, you probably have noticed that. How about the, the things to, the, that you have to accept if you if you're moving into that direction? Um, it is a distributed system, right? So you, you will be dealing with things like uh, network fallacy, right? So you're looking at microservices running on different nodes. In this talk, I'm focusing on compliance and compliance might mean a different number of, of different things. Um, we will hear, hear in the next talk uh, also, can you talk a li little bit more about a concrete case study in an enterprise setup? I'm talking in general terms here. Think of something like NIST SB 800-190, special publication around application security, containerized uh, applications. Think of, you know, don't bake a secret in the container image or something like that. Uh, you might, you know, um, if you're offering, if you're integrating with third party, um, payment solutions, you probably want to be PSI DSS compliant, right? You have challenges there or, or questions there. Fraud detection, right? You want to mitigate your risk. You want to make sure that you only allow good transactions, but how do you get that, right? You need to have a risk profile and you don't really want to include personal identifiable information there. And if you happen to offer some services in Europe, you also will uh, have to respect GDPR. So, um, you know, there's things that you simply cannot do with, uh, no matter what you want to do in terms of specialized or personalized ads. Um, you, you cannot use certain classes of, of data. So all kinds of usually external regulatory uh, compliance uh, arises. And we'll have a look at how GitOps can actually help you here. 
boils down a little bit to who is in control, who's in charge, and who's responsible for that. Might not necessarily be the same person at the end of the day, so uh, keep an eye out for that. I bet you've seen that, and you will be seeing that today and tomorrow a couple of times, so I'm not going to bore you with all the details, just to make sure everyone is on the same page. Um, GitOps gives you this cloud-native operations model. Git, the Git repo, um, matter of taste, is that one, is that two, multiple, uh, it's the single source of truth for all the state here, and you have agents uh, doing the reconciliation. Most importantly for you, let's focus on these three lower points here. All changes, doesn't matter if it's infrastructure level, you know, you're ramping up a new Kubernetes cluster, or application level, a new microservice is, is deployed, are observable, verifiable, and auditable. I can at any point in time, or I should at least, be able to say this container in this version on this node stems has been approved and, and is due to the change that this developer made in this place. And this is the person who uh, actually approved that this goes into, into production that this runs, right? That's the, the basic idea here. So stepping back a bit, if you look at the supply chain, which you know the, the, the idea, the concept essentially uh, borrowed from what we have with, with food, right? Where we can track back where does you know the, the burger come from, from what cow or whatever. Um, you uh, starting off with a code repository, you have a, a continuous integration where you testing and you build your artifacts, you put stuff into container registry, not necessarily only container images. You have Helm charts, OPA, uh, with the widespread um, support for OCI artifacts nowadays. You have a configuration repo. I already mentioned it earlier on. This might or might not be the same as the code repo where you're, you're using different branches or whatever. And then you have your runtime environment, in our case, Kubernetes. Right? So this is the supply chain from the left-hand side, developers, DevOps, um, to the platform and runtime side on, on the right-hand side. Now, if you look at where and how policy, and not all of that is necessarily uh, only or is limited to GitOps, uh, comes into place, uh, you can already start, and you should be starting probably in uh, in your IDE. So developers using various um, tools, IDEs, editors to write their source code, artifacts, uh, Helm charts, et cetera, et cetera. So you might have a plugin there um, that supports validating or, or verifying certain um, policies already there. Very often we see part of the repositories, so hooks there or in the CI pipeline bots, agents that look at certain events and then uh, react to that. Imagine, for example, you're sending in a pull request saying, all right, I want to deploy this change, you know, a couple of deployment services and persistent volumes or whatnot um, into this cluster, into this uh, namespace. Policy says, well, if you want to do that on, I don't know, a Friday afternoon, then it has to be signed off by two people, right? For example. So all of these things that can be automated, and this is, I think, one of the most important insights here. If you can automate it, then do automate it because people, humans, are not necessarily good at certain things, and bots, agents are. Um, and then obviously in part of the, the runtime, uh, we very often see that in the Kubernetes API server, for example, where you have webhooks, admission control, and uh, and so mutating or validating webhooks. Um, in whatever respect, in the last two, you, you very often uh, should be aware of what GitOps brings to the table and how you can use that to enforce um, or verify policies there. Now, if we look at the tooling, I am showing you here a few preliminary results from my this year's AWS Container Security Survey. I've linked the uh, GitHub repo there. Um, I've not yet published uh, the results. So these are two kind of like previews, sneak previews. I thought might be a nice uh, you know, place to, to share that and um, keep an eye on that, that repo if you're interested in. Uh, I did it last year, uh, this year, many more people. Um, participated. So thanks a lot for the support to your partners and, and the community. Um, and just to give you a feeling, if you are wondering like, oh, wow, that's the first time I hear about supply chain management. Like, you know, am, am I, I'm a totally out of the loop. Um, you probably get an idea here, right? Out of, of these 156 people answering 
or 152 in this case, answering the question, 142 essentially said not currently um, managing this supply chain in total and, and Graphia is, uh, you know, just a, a handful. So you're in, in good company. <laughs> Doesn't mean that you should uh, not consider it. It, is, it comes with, with obviously with um, a little bit of an investment. Uh, think of the entire supply chain. Um, as soon as you leave out one part, you cannot trace it back to the origin. So um, you probably sh want to keep an eye and, and you know, investigate research, uh, do a POC around that C for certain kinds of workloads, you probably want to, to introduce it. But again, um, don't worry, you're in good company if you haven't deployed something in that uh, either in totographies or some, some, some own uh, homegrown, homegrown thing I am yet. The case is a little, a little bit different, slightly different in uh, with respect to uh, declaratively managing policies. You also have a little bit more, um, and these are just three open source projects I'm mentioning here, CNCF uh, OPA, the open policy agent, um, that is a generic uh, rule engine, right? It's a gener generic policy engine, um, which means it's not you know limited to Kubernetes. You can represent anything that you want. Um, and it requires actually a, an integration or a concrete way to map the Kubernetes native way using custom resources, YAML manifests, um, to communicate that or translate that into what OPA internally uses, Rego, uh, the, the policy language, kind of like a data log um, inspired a way, which is usually a rather um, big ask to, to learn for, for people. So you would typically use Gatekeeper um, that essentially hooks into the API server and allows you to state policies, things like, you know, uh, only allow images that come from a certain uh, registry or whatever, things like that. So you're essentially um, splitting the, the responsibilities there, people writing these, these policies, the templates, uh, these people need to, to know and, and um, be able to write um, Rego. And um, there you probably end up using uh, Styra, the, the company, the startup behind uh, OPA uh, and their tooling and their experience to, to, to write that. And then Gatekeeper, the, the enforcement part that uh, allows the end user to use uh, the, the normal, the, the usual, uh, Kubernetes resources manifests to express these policies without having to learn a single line of Rego. I personally like Rego, but uh, I, I take it I'm in the minority. minority. Uh, another contender in this space is Kiberno, has a different uh, approach. Um, it's been introduced by Nimarta, another um, security related um, startup in, in this space, um, which essentially focuses on Kubernetes native policy management. So essentially comparing Kiverno with OPA is, is a bit unfair. You would really need to compare Kiverno with Gatekeeper if you wish. Uh, another one that I uh, had a look at a couple of, of weeks now and, and I'm in touch with the folks behind it is also. Um, it has is a slightly narrower focused and in scope, but it is a very powerful one as well, also open source. So um, have a look, you have, you have a, a lot of choice here. And to answer the question, what, what about the uptake? Uh, here you can see the, the two things that probably stand out or three things. OPA is, is quite widely used, 30%, uh, which is pretty consistent with last year. Um, and you also see uh, a bit less than a third using you know, their own uh, do-it-yourself policy management. Could be proprietary, could be something um, you know, built in-house. But almost half of the people out there still say, they're not yet managing or enforcing policies. Now, I didn't sort of drill down what that actually means, but it probably means none of the above. Um, so uh, you're not entirely off the hook. You're probably already a little bit under peer pressure to, to do something there. And the good news is the, the community there, if you look at um, you know, what's going on in the Slack channels, what's going on, uh, conference uh, talks, et cetera, et cetera, um, is definitely already in a place where if you are as a practitioner, you're running into an issue, how do I do, you know, how do I introduce gatekeeper in my setup, whatever, uh, you will very likely find uh, help in the community already. So a um, few excuses and I hope when I do that survey next year again, um, that uh, yeah, the, the last percentage, the, the 49 currently goes down to 10 or less. And you can help. 
Um, so summary, the wrapping up here, the, the challenge or the, the thing that I wanted to address up front with you, if you are an architect, C-level, uh, senior um, principal engineer level, you're wondering, is GitOps the right thing for me? I have a, you know, I'm in a regulated environment. I'm in a like financial institutions, healthcare, et cetera. And, you know, this whole automation and so on, that doesn't, doesn't sort of sound scary. Um, again, I'm trying to reinforce the message here. Yes, it is not only possible, but um, absolutely something I would uh, recommend you to have a look at. So Git is the single source of truth. Agent automate the state convergence and that let you know programs do what programs are good at, repetitive tasks. GitOps enables a high velocity and safe deploys with a very clean separation between the build and deploy cycle. GitOps essentially um, guarantees you that at any point in time it is captured uh, who requested a certain change. You know, I want to have this deployment in this environment and who approved that typically a combination of humans and uh, bots or whatever. Bots would um, check or, or verify things that you can easily uh, declaratively say, like it has to use images from this um, registry or you know it cannot, it must be signed by two people or whatever. And humans would um, check things that, that, uh, that are not trivially done by, by bots. And as I hinted in, at the last uh, part, auditing across the entire supply chain from the developer's desktop or laptop to a container running in production is not possible, not only possible, but something that people are already starting to do. If you wanna learn more about that, um, hang out. We are uh, on Slack available here. Uh, afterwards, we will have a uh, round table Q&A uh, later on after Fiji's uh, presentation. And if you want to learn more about a concrete use case in my reInvent talk in a couple of weeks uh, time, I will give a presentation with a customer, uh, a Australian bank, where they essentially uh, talk about how they successfully uh, applied GitOps in, in this financial institution um, environment. All right, and with that, I am uh, think I'm relatively good in time. So I'm gonna stop my screen share and see if there are any questions. Michael, thank you so much. Uh, that, that was a great talk. That was a great talk there. Thank you, Demi. Thank you. So we're, we're, we're asking that folks uh, drop their questions in the, uh, in the Slack channel. I know we're going right. to have you, we're going to have you uh, back up um, for a Q&A panel right after this talk from Kenechi. So uh, thanks, Michael. We'll have you, we'll have you back shortly. All right. Thank you so much. See you.